Luke chapter 2. Call this message, uh, Divine Encounters of the Third Kind. I remember a number of years ago they had a movie out, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, talking about contact with extraterrestrials. And uh, in Close Encounter of the Third Kind is where you actually have full contact with these beings supposedly from another planet or another dimension. Uh, this is close encounters, I guess, of the divine kind. Let's call it that. Close encounters of the divine kind. Because almost 2,000 years ago, on the hills just outside of Bethlehem, there were some shepherds watching their sheep. And an amazing thing happened. They suddenly had a close encounter of the divine kind. And we have a record of that in the Christmas story. Let's read it together this morning. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each in his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee to the city of Naz from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary who was engaged to him and was with child and while they were there the days were completed for her to give birth and she gave birth to her firstborn son she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began to say to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. And there you have it. One of the most beautiful, one of the most sweet stories in the Bible. Uh, the story, certainly, of the birth of our Lord on what looked like it was going to be a very ordinary night. Uh, Mary and Joseph made their way to Bethlehem. Uh, Caesar thought he needed money. The real reason for it all was God needed to get that couple to Bethlehem because the prophets had said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And so, so they were there. You know there was no room for them in the inn. And so they stayed in a stable. And there in a stable, Mary gave birth to the Son of God, the Messiah, in a stable of all places. So, the Son of God came into the world. The first smells he smelt were the, the smells of a stable. The straw, the manure. Uh, what a setting for such an event. But it would not be an ordinary night. Uh, the angels appeared to the shepherds. First, uh, the herald angel. 
We say he sang, actually. There's no singing spoken up here. They spoke. We later, later put it all to music. And so it began. As shepherds were the first to hear the good news. I bring you good news. That's what the gospel means. A message of great joy, which we celebrated afresh this morning when we lit the third candle of the Advent wreath. Joy. You know, there are so many lessons to be learned from this encounter. And I'm sure, uh, as I draw your attention to a few of them this morning, Jim, if he wanted to, could preach on the same passage next week and find even more there. How do I know this? Because, you know, I've been enjoying listening to, James, uh, to Jim, it's James, Jim, preach since uh, I retired. And he's preaching passages that I preached two, three times and taught on many times. And yet every time he does it, I learn something new. As he notices something I've never noticed before. So at some point, I'm sure that Jim will preach on this passage again and he will see things that I didn't see. Uh, but I want to bring to your attention again this morning a few things that I think the Spirit of God has shown me from this passage, from this incredible encounter that the shepherds have. And the first is kind of an amazing message about divine selection. We read that there were some shepherds out in the field. And, uh, you know, that sounds great to us, little kids dress up like shepherds. Sounds fine. But in the social strata, of ancient Palestine, uh, that would place them on the lower end of the social economic scale. Uh, these people smelt like sheep. They lived with sheep. And personal hygiene was not something that was easily attained in the ancient world. So uh, we, we understand these were the sheep that were used in the uh, temples worship. Uh, they were out year round, uh, but even cold weather could not disguise the smell. I assure you, when they brought the sheep to the temple and when they then took the money they earned to the marketplace, uh, probably the owners of those uh, market stalls would say, eh, here come the shepherds. And they would breathe through their mouths. And then when the shepherds breathed, uh, left, they could breathe again, and there was that smell there. Uh, this was not something you aspired to be, and you certainly didn't uh, tell your children, I hope that you grow up someday to be a shepherd. So, the Son of God is born. The Messiah, the one Israel had waited for for centuries, is suddenly in the earth. And if you think there's going to be a birth announcement, who should receive that birth announcement? A Caesar, perhaps. But the angels didn't appear to Caesar. Well, how, how about the, the Roman and governor? Uh, we read that this census was first announced when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Uh, no angels showed up to talk to Quirinius. Or the Roman governors of the area. No one showed up to talk to Herod. And if anyone could have used a visit from an angel, it was Herod. You know, Herod could have used a visit from three ghosts. The ghost of Christmas past, uh, the ghost of Christmas present, and the, the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Uh, but no angel showed up to talk to Herod, who was ruling that particular region with an iron hand. Uh, well, maybe the high priest. I mean, in the ancient religion, the best religion in the world, a religion that had actually been given to men by God himself, uh, the high priest of Israel was the Pope. They didn't have popes in those days, but they did have a high priest. So surely, uh, the angels are going to come and talk to the leader of the best religion in the world. The leader of a religion that was actually given to the world by God himself. And you know what? That night, the high priest went to bed and slept like a rock. Totally unaware. But just a few miles away in Bethlehem, the Messiah was being born. No rich merchants were told. The upper class was not tipped off. Uh, just simple working men. 
doing one of the most in, in undesirable jobs that a person could do. And God said to the angels of heaven, tell the shepherds. How strange. How wonderful. Because the angels would say, I bring you glad tidings which shall be for all the people. Not just the powerful. Not just the famous. Not just the wealthy. All the people. And they would have heard Israel. But Luke is writing a gospel that is written actually to the Romans. And he wants them to understand that the promise of Israel's Messiah is to all the people. And God, I think, in announcing this good news first to the shepherd, is saying, do you think you are a nobody? Do you think you're unimportant? Do you think your work does not matter? Think of how a shepherd must have felt about his work. Another night on the hillside, watching sheep. No one likes us except other shepherds. People avoid us, they think we stink. But God loves little people too. That is such good news. I bring you good tidings of great joy, little people, little shepherds. God cares about you. God loves you. And the message that God has for the world, which is going to be proclaimed first to you, is a message for the likes of you. Oh, the intellectual class, so proud of their knowledge, will dismiss it. The powerful will persecute those who believe this message. But God loves people like you because with God there are no little people and there are no little places. So said Francis Schaeffer, and it is so true. As you go about your daily business, you matter to God. But you're not famous. No one knows me. God does. And if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are a child of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, a trophy of his saving grace. Oh, how you matter to him. Everything you go through in your life, the good times and the bad times, he is there with you. Uh, you matter to him. And there are miserable, famous people who will kill themselves in the coming year. It happens every year, doesn't it? They seem to have everything that this world says is worth having. The wealth, the fame, popularity, and they're miserable. Why? Because the message that came to you, the message of eternal life through Jesus Christ, if they ever heard it, they rejected it, but you have believed And you are the direct object of the love of God. It's one message. The message also tells us a great deal about that baby that was born in Bethlehem. Uh, we are told that it is unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Three words want to draw your attention to a savior now these were Jewish men and if you ask them does Israel need a savior they would have said yeah yeah for sure but they would not have understood what the angels said the same way you understand that term because Israel was waiting for a political savior they were waiting for someone who would deliver them from the oppressive yoke of the Romans and to this day, that is the kind of Messiah the Jewish people are waiting for. 
And so when the angel says a Savior has been born, they would have understood that as they would have understood that. Uh, they would not have understood how pregnant with meaning that word Savior was. Yes, someday he will come. Someday he will deliver evil. We call uh, Israel from all evil. We call that the second advent. They did not understand the significance of that first advent, though they were participants in it. But we, looking back, understand the full meaning of that term Savior. Because their greatest need was not salvation from the Romans. Their greatest need was not a political salvation. And that's really what the world wants, you know. They would like Jesus to come and bring peace and leave them alone. But the world is lost. And Israel was lost. And they didn't know it. They were lost in the trespasses and sins. And the offerings that were offered by the high priest year by year uh, postponed the judgment of God that was sure to fall on them if nothing was done about their sin problem. They needed a savior. Not someone to save them from the Romans, someone to save them from their sins. Uh, they were dead in trespasses and sin. And they were destined to an eternity without God, without hope if someone didn't do something about their sin. And the problem was they couldn't fix the problem themselves. And that is our problem too. Every single person born into this sin-ruined world has a sin problem. Uh, we are sinners. By nature and by choice. We are spiritually dead now, and if nothing is done about our sin problem, we will experience what the Bible refers to as the second death, eternal damnation, separated from God for all eternity. We are hopelessly lost, and we cannot save ourselves. We are like drowning men in the middle of the ocean. We have no chance. As we desperately fight the waves that will ultimately win the battle, and drag us down into the deep. And we call for help because we're lost and dying. It's just a matter of time. And then someone shows up and reaches out a hand and pulls us to safety. And that's what the angels were saying to the shepherds. This baby that is born is the Messiah. We'll talk about that. But he is here on a mission to save. Not from the Romans, but from sin. And through him, God is going to provide salvation. As a matter of fact, uh, they named the little baby. They were told to by the angel Jesus. And that name means Jehovah's salvation. Yahweh's salvation. The salvation of Yahweh. There he is in a manger. But he's going to grow up. He's going to be a great teacher. But God did not send him to the world because the world needed another teacher. The world has plenty of teachers. The prophets were fine teachers. The world needed a savior. And God had a plan from the foundation of the world. Seeing us even before the human race came into existence in our sin... The plan was to send his son into the world because in spite of our sin, in spite of our lostness, in spite of our brokenness and our rebellion against God, God has chosen to love people. People who will repent of their sons and believe in his son. But what about the sin problem? Oh, all of those lambs that were sacrificed, they were watching sheep that would be sacrificed. Uh, the baby they would see that night 
was the Lamb of God. And one day, fully grown, the baby they saw in the manger would carry a cross towards Golgotha, collapse beneath its weight, fight to get to the top of that hill where he would be crucified, where he would bleed and die, and offer himself as a sacrifice to God for shepherds and for us. That was the mission. You see, they would taunt him from the cross and they would say, he saved others, he can't save himself. And what they didn't realize is that is exactly correct. The only way he could save others was to allow them to kill him. He could not save himself and us, so he chose to save us. And there on the cross, he endured the penalty of our sin. He suffered and died to pay for our sin so that our sin problem could be fixed, so that we could be saved. And so there we are, drowning in the ocean of our sin, and Jesus reaches out a nail-pierced hand and says, Take my hand and I'll save you. A Savior born for you this day. A Savior. I want to tell you about that Savior. He is Christ. That is the uh, uh, transliteration of the Greek word Christos which means Messiah. He is the Messiah. Messiah the Lord. When the Jews, are, the Jews to this day are very reverent about the name of God. They never want to violate the commandment to take the, not take the Lord's name in vain. So I have an Orthodox Jewish friend and whenever he writes me, always when he spells God, we'll put G-D. And an Orthodox Jew does that because they want to treat the name of God with reverence. When he speaks of God, he uses a Hebrew term that means the name. Uh, being careful not to use the name of God, lest he use it lightly or irreverently. So, what do you do when you're translating the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek? Well, the translators of that Old Testament chose the term, the Lord. And they used it whenever the covenant-keeping name of, of God was used. And so what he is saying to these shepherds, that a herald angel is the Savior is more than you think he is. Yes, he is the Messiah. But he's Messiah the Lord. Messiah God, if you will. It is God himself. We understand the second person of the Trinity. The very Son of God. Is who the Messiah is. And that's who he is. And so the shepherds, we read, make haste to go to Bethlehem, and they find the stable. And they go and see Mary and Joseph. Mary, no doubt, exhausted that night, as you understand, women. And they see the baby, helpless, Wrapped in swaddling clothes or cloths, as was the custom to protect the baby from the cold of the night. Helpless, unable to speak. Unable to control his hands or his feet in any meaningful way. Unable yet to form rational thought or speak. And yet... A baby is God. Think about that. It's a song a number of years ago. What if God was one of us? Well, for a moment in human history, he was. A human being, yes, fully man. An ordinary human baby. And yet, at the same time, fully God. God.
I don't know what happened that night. Did the baby cry when they entered the stable? Did the baby awake? Uh, Luther wrote, the cattle are going, the baby awakes. But little poor Jesus, no crying he makes. Maybe it was like that. Maybe they looked into those eyes that could not focus yet. And as they did, they were looking into the eyes of God. Not only did we need a Savior, we needed a certain kind of Savior. We needed a divine Savior because only God could offer a sacrifice of infinite worth capable of saving the world. If the world believed, it had to be a man. But the Savior also had to be God. So as one preacher many years ago said, when the blood of Jesus flowed down his arm, down that rugged cross, and fell finally to the ground, it was the blood of God, the blood of man. Only that blood could save sinners like you and like me and like the shepherds from their sin. Just one final lesson from this divine encounter that I want you to notice, and that is the change it made in the shepherds. They were now on a mission. The first mission was to go see. But man, did you notice they went back to the hillside transformed? And when they went into town, they were telling everyone, you know what, an amazing thing happened to us on the hillside the other night. You should know about it. And people who heard it began to wonder. They scratched their beards and said, could it be? We know he's going to be born in Bethlehem someday. Was he born the other night? Did angels really talk to these shepherds? Yeah, whatever they thought. The shepherds went back, we read, to their previous vocation. The shepherds went back. But now they're singing shepherds, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen that had been told to them. They were transformed. They were changed. And I think the implication is the change was permanent. They were not what they were before. That's what happens when you have a divine encounter of the third kind. You're changed. You're changed forever. God does a work in your heart. Now, if you've grown up in the faith, you probably didn't notice. But at some time, when you truly believed, perhaps your parents noticed. Uh, you can look back and see, uh, maybe with pleasure, that I can't remember not believing. But I have a certain way of thinking that it's different value system. I'm not like my peers who don't know the Savior. I'm different. Indeed. If you have truly had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, it will change you. It will transform you. Paul wrote about it and said, If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Now behold, the old is gone, the new has come. Things are changing even now. As we grow in grace. And so we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin and someday... When God has finished that good work he began in us, we will be, as the old song says, saved to sin no more. Isn't that wonderful? 
Huh, what, a, what an amazing God. He takes shepherds and transforms them into evangelists. Puts songs in their heart and on their lips that were not there before. The world's still broken. But God has begun something in them. Something real. Something eternal. Something so certain that Paul could write, He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You have a song this morning? Has your life been changed? You've heard the facts of the gospel. Have you ever in repentant faith said, Lord Jesus Christ, I, I've heard that you offered yourself as a sacrifice for my sin. I accept that. It's my only hope. I believe. Come into my life and begin that transformation process. Make me your very own. God offers a wonderful salvation to you as a gift, a Christmas gift, if you will. And once again this morning, uh, you have heard the invitation. Please, don't leave here this morning without accepting the gift. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. The gift of God is eternal life. You have spoken through your servants. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the message you proclaim to the shepherds and afresh to us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son. Jesus, our Savior. Pray this in his name.